Hi, this is Orion, and you're listening to Orion's Bedtime Stories Podcast. Well, I have a number of short stories and fairy tales here. For the next little while, I'll be sharing a large chapter book with you. Illusion by Paula Volsky. For 200 years, the exalted classes have ruled over Vonar by virtue of their dazzling magical abilities. Now, their powers grown slack from disuse, they concentrate on the pleasures their station affords them, ignoring the misery of the lower classes. It is only when the red tide of revolution sweeps aside all distinctions of rank, home, and family that the exalted realize the gravity of their mistake. Thrust into the very center of the conflict is the beautiful Elise Faux de Raval, spirited daughter of a provincial landowner. Now, like those she disdained, she must scramble for bread in the teeming streets of the capital city, the key to her abilities and elusive secret, and find a way to survive in a world gone mad with liberty. Orion's Bedtime Stories is proudly brought to you by Anchor FM. And if you've not heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Firstly, it is free, and they have creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Then they distribute your podcast for you so you can be heard on Spotify, Apple, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership required. So you have everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. So... Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started today. Hi there, and welcome back to Orion's Bedtime Stories. Um, I'm having a little bit of hoarseness tonight, so I hope you will bear with me as I do my reading. It doesn't hurt, but um, it is a little bit scratchy. So I'm going to continue with the reading that... uh, I started last night. I'm reading Illusion by Paula Volsky, and this is chapter two. Elise did try her best. Directly following her conversation with Dref Zinosun, she sought out her father, locating him in his study, a favorite haunt wherein the Marquis Vauderaval pursued his sole hobby, the preservation and study of medical curiosities. There he often sat, surrounded by his treasured collection of misshapen human bones and skulls, two-headed embryos, three-armed fetuses, mummified dwarves and hunchbacks, shrunken heads, abnormal armed, abnormal organs, eyes, and brains preserved in chemical baths. Often he would spend hours at his desk composing and polishing some careful description of his latest freakish marvel, and at such at such times he was almost happy. Not today, however. One glance at her father's face informed Elise that her cause was all but hopeless. Out of temper and out of sorts, the Marquise had started drinking hours earlier than usual. Now, although it was barely midday, <clears throat> his cheeks were suggestively flushed, his eyes bloodshot and puffy-lidded. A taciturn, handsome man, in the prime of life, much resembling his daughter in face, with the same fine features and fair complexion, a little vain of his p- appearance, the Marquise was customarily fastidious. But now his peruke was out of curl, his cravat was twisted awry, and yesterday's lace hung limp at his wrists. His heavy frown and the compression of his lips communicated choler. Elise regarded him with little optimism and less affection. Raised by servants and tutors, in accordance with the custom of the time, she'd had little contact with either parent throughout the course of her life. She saw them at mealtimes, at family gatherings and feast days, generally in the midst of kinsmen and servants. Her dealing with her morosely laconic father were uncomfortable and blessedly infrequent. 
In, the, in a case of this sort, she hardly knew how to approach him. It was with much reluctance that she touched upon the matter of Zen Subusan. Insubordinate, disobedient, a troublemaker, stated the Marquise. Oh, surely not, father. A thoughtless youth, merely. Not sufficiently thoughtless. When we have driven all subservice subversive thought from his head, he will be much improved. But a whipping, Elise's nostrils flared in distaste. It is so disagreeable. This Subasan is my maid's intended. If he is beaten, she'll sulk for days, and I shall be forced to endure her foul humor. So do think of me. Are there, oh, are there no other means of correction? None so effective. We must consider the mental and moral limitations of the culprit. This serf will find a sound thrashing quite comprehensible. I suppose so. But really, it's unpleasant to think of such things. I believe you might let him off, and be none the worse for it. What harm is a little leniency just this once? Great harm. You have not let learned you have not yet learned how to deal with underlings, that is clear. The serfs of our degenerate age are presumptuous and recalcitrant beyond endurance. It is unwise to indulge them. Then perhaps an hour or two in the pillory, without the whipping. Insufficient. The serf deliberately flouted the will of his seigneur, and he must suffer for it. There is no other means whereby discipline will be maintained. Presumably the sight of this Subasan's blood will prove instructive to others contemplating similar disobedience. Oh, but the fellow's offense was quite trifling, scarcely, scarce worthy of serious attention. Only consider, father. Elise spoke on in vain. Her arguments, pleas, and cajolery served only to solidify the Marquise's resistance. His face was hardening even while she watched. The bloodshot gray eyes went steely, and the drink-slackened jaw set. Opposition was worse than useless, probably only fueled the other's quiet rage, and in any case, it was a cause for which she had little true feeling. Every word she uttered was worsening things for the miserable victim, and presently she had to give it up. Additional insistence would only have increased the severity of Zen's punishment, which already stood at twelve strokes of the lash, followed by pillory confinement until sundown. Even as it was, her intervention bore undesirable consequences. Zealous in defense of his threatened dignity, the Marquise now took it into his head to combine the spectacle of Zen's chastisement with a long overdue purring, or performance of the ritual gestures and exclamations of joy with which serfs traditionally greeted the return of their seigneur following prolonged absence. The Marquise Vauderaval had spent a recent joyless month in Shireen, transacting business and renewing his acquaintances at court, whose elite, elite members regarded him as a provincial booby. The experience had chafed his spirits, which now required the balm of adulation, spontaneous or otherwise. Elise looked on in silent disgust as the appropriate orders were issued to the household steward. No sooner had the servant left the room than she made her feelings known. To order a whipping in conjunction with the purring is grotesque, she observed. Worse than grotesque, it's downright tasteless. I do not share your opinion, the Marquise replied expressionlessly. You cannot really mean to do such a thing. It's outrageous. And call the steward back and tell him you've changed your mind. Or let me tell him, she reached for the bell pull. Leave that alone. You speak your mind rather too freely, 
It is best you learn that I tolerate disrespect neither from my serfs nor from my family members. I meant no disrespect, father. I was only trying to... In contradicting me, you merely confirm my judgment. I have been lax. It is time you recalled who is master here. The double spectacle of purring and punishment may serve to jog your memory, and therefore you will view them both. I'd rather not. Immaterial. I'm engaged. I have other plans. Cancel them. I won't. I will have a couple of the footmen drag you from your chamber by force, if necessary. You will find it uncomfortable and most undignified. Her complaints were fervent but useless. The Marquise was in no mood to, book op to brook opposition, and thus, hours later, in the early evening, when the serf's labors had ended for the day, Elise found herself down by the stables where the pillory and whipping post stood. The Marquise and his daughter sat on <clears throat> sat in a one-horse open chaise, with the Marquise himself handling the ribbons. Elise would rather have taken them herself, for her father's competence was momentarily open to question. The Marquise had continued drinking throughout the day. He carried his liquor well, only the glassy sheen of the gray eyes and the tremor of the hand grasping the whip suggested diminished control. In the west the sun blazed fiercely, despite the lateness of the hour. The days were long now, and it would remain light for another two hours or more. A broad straw hat with a veil of rose gauze and a tilting parasol held in a lace-mitted hand shaded Elise's white skin against the punishing rays, but could not banish the intense heat. Beneath the veil, her forehead was damp with sweat, and her light, balloon-sleeved gown of raspberry voile was beginning to stick to her flesh. Unobtrus <clears throat> unobtrusively she plucked at the dress, tugged at her corset, and wished herself a thousand miles away, or at least back in her own room with a loose, cool dressing gown, a chilled verbena tisane, a, a good poem or play to read, and a decent maid to ply the feather fan. The spectacle before her lacked appeal. She'd never in her life witnessed a purring that proved anything less than farcical. All the Daraval serfs, house servants and field workers alike, were assembled and ranged in orderly rows. That they were there against their will was evident in the sullen, sagging shoulders, the shuffling footsteps, the downcast, resentful eyes. Resentful, she thought, as never before. Perhaps that was only imagination. All of those faces were familiar to Elise, but some in particular drew her eyes irresistibly. There was Steli, strong jaw set, black brows lowering, baleful black eyes beaming defiance. Beside her stood her father, Zeno, bowed head uncovered in the presence of the seigneur, eyes dutifully downcast, all very proper, but wasn't it perhaps a shade too perfect? Where, after all, had his offspring learned their insolence? But these were ridiculous fancies, quickly dispelled, and her gaze jumped to the little dairymaid, Kerth, whose big round eyes in a small round face promised biddable good nature. That one, definitely, thought Elise. She'll replace Steli, the sooner the better. Her efforts to focus her attention upon a pleasant prospective acquisition were unsuccessful, and her eyes traveled, against her will, to Dref Zinosen's face. It had always been upsetting to her, even painful, to watch Dref participate in a purring. In some manner she could hardly define, she felt ashamed, humiliated for his sake, and that was clearly absurd. Dref Zinosen, a serf born and bred, was only fulfilling the natural obligations of his kind. It was right, 
proper and indeed inevitable that he should do so. Probably the ritual imposed no very great hardship on him. Despite his peculiar cleverness, he could hardly possess the fine sensitivities of his exalted masters, and it was a mistake to imagine that he suffered the pangs that she herself would experience if subjected to similar indignity. Nevertheless, she did not like to see him here. She could not, and she could not seem to forbear looking for him. There he was, only a few yards distant, once again attired in his ordinary working garb, a wise move in view of the Marquise's present move. His tanned face was frozen and rigidly expressionless, the eyes unreadable. So he appeared at every purring. She had seen it often, but today something in his complete stillness seemed somehow wrong even ominous, for reasons she couldn't explain to herself, at least was uneasy. At a command from the steward, the purring commenced, and the serfs plodded through the time-honored sequences. First came the harmonious exclamations of gratitude attendant upon the safe return of the seigneur. Then the traditional obeisances, the bowing, scraping, the dirt-thumping, designed to express both veneration and fear. Then the kneeling parade, so difficult for those with aging joints, followed by the formal suit for indulgence, droned out in unison by all present. With a gesture, the Marquise Vaudervel signaled his assent, whereupon the assembled menials ventured to raise eyes hitherto fixed firmly upon the soil. It was commonly taught that the magical glance of an exalted possessed the power to kill. Hence, that power must be consciously leashed before the inferiors might safely encounter exalted eyes. In recent years, the legend had been widely questioned. Still, few dared disregard it altogether but Dreft dared, and so did his sister. Their eyes had remained fixed on the Marquise's face throughout. The purring continued, and Elise fidgeted, prey to discomfort and impatience. The sun was low in the sky, the shadows long, but the heat continued infernal. Her palms were sweating and itchy, her lace mitts damply intolerable. Setting the parasol aside for a moment, she drew the mitts from her hands. If anyone disapproved, so much the worse. No one noticed. The Marquise did not so much as glance in her direction. He was watching his serfs, who now cut lackluster ceremonial capers. Half-heartedly they spun, hopped, pranced, and cavorted. Their leaps were perfunctory, visibly listless. The Marquise observed it and frowned. Leaning forward in his seat, he caught the steward's eye and tapped the butt of his whip upon the carriage floor. Instantly the steward clapped his hands and the vigor of the serf's capers increased. But the mandatory enthusiasm was short-lived and the Marquise's frown deepened. The least gaze returned to Dreff whose wooden-jointed shuffle conveyed indifference verging on insult. Then, almost as if he felt the pressure of her gaze, he turned and met her eyes. His face was perfectly impassive, deliberately unrevealing, but for some reason the pain shot through her, a rush of misery and shame so acute that it brought tears to her eyes. She did not know the cause, perhaps an attack of the vapors. Unfortunately, it did not last long. Drift turned away. Her inexplicable tears dried, and the gauzy veil shielded her momentary lapse. The capering drew to a close, and the purring concluded with a grand ululation, uttered without elan. And the last quavering cry died away. The Marquise cut a curt 
nodded a curt acknowledgment, and the kneeling serfs arose, most of them dripping with sweat of their unwilling exertions, all of them coated with grime. His lordship's expression remained sour. The spectacle had not fulfilled his expectations. The sweat shed on his behalf was insufficient. The tribute was grudging, and his pique remained unassuaged. It required the sight of sufferings greater than his own to restore his spirits. The Marquise drew forth a lace-edged handkerchief, patted his moist brow, and gestured irritably. It was the signal for Borlo Bunison, the Daraval blacksmith and designed dispenser of the signor's justice, to initiate the second half of the proceedings by fetching Zen Subasan from his stable prison. Before Borlo had stirred, Drefsinosan stepped out of his place in line. The steward clapped his hands frantically but ineffectually. Dref advanced several paces toward the chaise and paused. The Marquise's brows rose in surprised displeasure. "'Signor, may I speak?' Dref inquired in a voice that carried, despite its quietness. He stood straight and tall, somehow achieving a look of consequence, despite his shabby garments. That unconscious pride subtly galled the Marquise, whose present temper demanded deference. Without troubling to reply, he turned to the steward and snapped his fingers. The flustered steward hurried forward to lay a hand on Dreff's shoulder. The young man shook him off easily. "'But one word, Signor,' Dreff persisted. "'I entreat you.' The word entreat exerted a soothing effect, and the Marquise hesitated. "'Why not?' Elise murmured, negligent manner masking an acute sense of foreboding. "'Very well,' the Marquise conceded. "'Be brief.' A wandering mutter arose among the mutter watching serfs. The steward's quick reproof quelled them, but could not still the whispery agitation of their ranks. Seigneur, I ask leave to plead on behalf of the serf Zen Subasan. Dreff spoke quickly clearly cognizant of his master's limited patience. I beseech your mercy in the commutation of this serf's corporal punishment on the following grounds. The first, that Subasan is young, ardent, highly impressionable, and too subject to the force of questionable influences. Be patient with him, Signor. Already he has perceived his errors, and maturity will grant greater wisdom. The second reason, that the serf Subasan is not robust. Since earliest childhood, this loyal retainer of your lordship has suffered fainting fits, palpitations, shortness of breath, and every variety of illness. He is constitutionally unfit to endure physical hardship. Therefore, I pray your lordship will display the large compassion that is the hallmark of exalted nobility in sparing the lash and accepting the contrition of a misguided but truly repentant servant. It was not a poor effort, but the Marquise reacted badly. To a least, the reason was obvious. Dreff simply spoke too well, better, in fact, than the seigneur himself. Those polished, elaborate sentences did not fit the mouth of a serf that glib eloquence seemed to mock the articulation of his betters. And despite Dreff's careful adherence to all the requisite forms of humility, despite the respectfully uncovered head and belatedly downcast eyes, the effect was not convincingly reverent. The young man had not mastered the finer points of servility, probably never would. His speech, his appearance, his manner were indefinably vexing, and the Marquise's hackles rose. His bloodshot eyes gleamed. 
but he replied with apparent composure, Back to your place. Draft did not move. Signor, hear me, he persevered, and behind him another startled murmuring arose. You are eminent, great, and fortunate. You possess wealth, rank, and influence. Much has been given to you, nearly everything, in fact, that the world holds valuable. Such ease and plenty must surely foster generosity to those less favored than yourself. I ask you to display that generosity now in extending mercy to Zen Subasan and to all others whose lives chance has entrusted to your power. Worse and worse, he should never had equated exalted power with the careless gifts of fortune. The reference suggested a possible impermanence unpalatable to his lordship, and there was still that damnable articulateness unpalatable to his lordship. Flushing angrily, the Marquis snapped a single command. Back! Dreff reddened in return, but still he did not move. Signor, an act of charity costing you nothing purchases the gratitude and loyalty of your subordinates. Purchase? They are mine by right, the Marquise observed. Turning to Borlo Bunison, he commanded, Fetch! Borlo made for the stables. Signor, if you will but consider, Draff attempted, but this time he had overshot his mark. Enough! The Marquise's hand clenched on the butt of the whip. Back, or we shall witness a double thrashing. He did not raise his voice, but his sweat-dewed face had darkened ominously. El <laughs> Elise regarded him with mingled nervousness and distaste. Dreff hesitated a dangerous moment. The surf watched in rapt silence. Once more, the steward approached to lay a hand on his arm, and this time Dreff suffered himself to be drawn away. Elise drew a relieved breath, and then grew angry. What business had he causing difficulties and frightening her so? If he'd gotten himself in trouble, it would have served him right. Borlo Bunison emerged from the stable, a horse whip tucked beneath his arm. With him came the wretched Zen Subasan, composed but waxen pale. Elise recognized him at once. She had seen him often enough about the estate, but never before known the name of this quiet, fragile, big-eyed boy of about nineteen, with the mop of dust-colored hair the large head tapering from broad brow to pointed chin, the long neck and outsized Adam's apple, set atop a short and skinny body. His smock had been removed in the stable, exposing a small, hairless chest and narrow, bony shoulders. It was hard to imagine what the strapping Steli saw in such a runt. But Zen's white face was intelligent and sensitive. Perhaps that explained it. Borlo led his captain captive to the post, which Zen was required to embrace. Tossing his whip aside for the moment, the blacksmith drew a length of cord from his pocket, bound the other's wrists as securely, and fastened the cord to an iron ring sunk into the oak some six feet above the ground. Zen offered no resistance. He had been schooled in submission since infancy. In any case, the hu huge and iron-muscled blacksmith could easily have broken him in two. Resting his forehead against the post, Zen quietly awaited the worst. Borlo stepped back, retrieved the whip, and cast an inquiring glance at his master. The Marquis inclined his head. Borlo half turned, lifted his arm, 
and sent the lash singing through the air to meet the victim's exposed flesh with a sickening slap. Elise started at the sound. Zen stiffened, his hands clenched, and he pressed his face hard against the post. No sound escaped him. Three more evenly timed blows followed, and Zen maintained silence. Angry red welts marked his back, but the thin skin had not been broken. It was clear that Borlo Bunison was by no means putting forth his best efforts. This might not have mattered had Zen but produced the whimpers, moans, and squirming contortions the Marquise's frustrations demanded. But the victim refused to oblige. Two more cracking z strokes, and Zen remained stubbornly silent. His eyes were squeezed shut, his lips drawn back in a pained grimace, and he was quivering all over, but still he did not cry out. His resistance verged on open defiance, and as such his master regarded it. The Marquise caught the blacksmith's eye, gestured with a crook of his single finger. Barlow's heavy shoulders sketched a shrug, and the force of his blows increased. The whip descended on Zen's shoulders with a wicked snap, with, with a wicked snap, and this time a tracery of blood welled in its wake. Elise shuddered and turned her face away. The scene before her, perhaps combined with the breathless heat and the tightness of her stays, was exerting its effect, and she was growing a little light-headed. It was neither the time nor the place to indulge in a ladylike faint. Lifting her veil, she breathed deeply, but the hot, heavy air brought no relief. Thrice more she heard the thud of the lash on naked flesh, but not a sound from Zen. Then an excited murmur arose th um, among the watching serfs. Then an excited murmur arose among the watching serfs, and Elise turned back to look. Her eye fell on Borlo Bonison, who stood motionless, head cocked a little, horse whip dangling limp at his side, then traveled to Zen Subasan, whose back was now marked with the blood of four long crisscrossing cuts. But that was not the worst of it. Something was wrong with Zen, something that went beyond the predictable, rea predictable reaction to an ordinary flogging. The boy's sweat-soaked face had gone a dreadful shade of gray. His head was flung back, eyes and mouth wide open. For some reason, he seemed to be drowning on dry land. His chest heaved, he gasped desperately, and inexplicable inexplicable spasms racked his small frame. Some moments later, his knees buckled and he slumped within his bonds, whose tension was now all that held him upright. Borlo looked to his master. The Marquis crooked a finger. The blacksmith shrugged and lifted his arm. Stop it, Elise exclaimed much to her own surprise. Several of the serfs stared at her, but the Marquise appeared death. Father, that boy is sick. Shamming, replied his lordship, without her turning his head. Surely not. Call it off, father. Please. You are easily hoodwinked. With a snap of his fingers in Borlo's direction, the Marquise commanded, Proceed. The lash whistled, and blood welled from a new cut. It was unclear whether Zen Subasan felt it. His body was jerking oddly, but he appeared unconscious, or nearly so. One more stroke, the twelfth and last. The lash bit deep, but this time there was no reaction. Having maintained perfect silence throughout the ordeal, Zen now hung motionless and insensible. Tossing his whip aside, Borlo trudged to the post 
and loosed the captive's wrists. Zen tumbled full length to the ground. Once again, the blacksmith hesitated. Proceed, the Marquise repeated. Grasping his victim under the armpits, Borlo dragged the recumbent body toward the pillory. As Elise looked on in dismay, Zen's body bounced over rock and sod. She had the feeling that she ought to do or say something, but she didn't know what. How, after all, could she dispute his lordship's direct orders? As it happened, she didn't need to. Before Borlo reached his destination, the Marquise's personal barber and leech, Guel Azor, had broken out of line to approach his fallen compeer. Kneeling, Guel listened for a heartbeat, searched the throat and, list, and wrist for a pulse. Finding none, he lifted his head to proclaim, Signor, he's dead. Total silence greeted this announcement. The assembled serfs stood staring. After a moment, Elise's eyes jumped without volition to Steli Zeno's girl, who appeared frozen, perhaps momentarily comprehending, then turned to the, to the Marquise, whose expression had not altered in the slightest. "'What is the cause of death?' inquired his lordship calmly. Signor, it's hard to say, replied Gil Azor. He has not bled to death, I presume. No, Signor. Poor Zen was always sickly, though. Ah, he was congenitally defective, observed the Marquise, interest, qu interest quickening. That's one way of putting it, Signor. Zen's had these attacks ever since he was a child. Attacks of what nature? I can't be sure, Signor. It may be he had an excess of the melancholy humor that made the. F it may be he had an excess of the melancholy humor that made for inner rebellions. I see. An internal flaw, possibly of unusual nature. In that case, you will perform a dissection in order to determine the precise nature of this serf's imperfection. Assuming success on your part, I shall observe the abnormal organs, and perhaps if warranted, submit a monograph on the subject to the Royal Academy. A general intake of breath, a collective stirring of shock or revulsion, flooded the ranks of the serfs. At least <laughs> stared, astonished and disgusted. Guel Azor looked helplessly thunderstruck. Almost, for an instant, he seemed to contemplate remonstrance, then thought the better of it and dipped his head in mute acquiescence. As the carcass is bound to corrupt swiftly in this weather, I cannot countenance delay. You will perform your task this very evening. Guel, though clearly troubled, bowed in silence shared by all of his fellows, all but one. For the second time that evening, Dref Zinosan presumed to address his master without leave. Dref was white beneath his tan, and his face was set like a death mask. Certainly there was something peculiar, even unnerving, in his aspect, something suggestive of violent currents swirling beneath an ice-skimmed surface. Advancing to stand almost as if protectively before the corpse, he observed much too calmly. Your lordship's decision no doubt inadvertently imposes additional suffering upon the family and friends of Zen Subasan. I trust this is far from your lordship's intent, and therefore I request the seigneur to grant his serf the ordinary decency of conventional burial. The Marquise appeared to debate the necessity of reply. At last he chose to answer, Following surgical investigation, the remains, those that have not been set aside for chemical preservation and future study, may be collected, reassembled, 
buried or otherwise disposed of, the sooner the better. I consent to this. Signor, Dreff's hands were tightly clasped behind his back, and still he spoke with rigid, rigid self-restraint. Zen Subasan is not a laboratory specimen, nor is he a domestic beast bred for consumption. He is a human being like yourself, entitled both in life and in death to a certain basic measure of human dignity. No man possesses the right to defile his remains. That is incorrect. I shall indulge, indulge your impertinence in view of the singular circumstances that apparently cloud your judgment, and thus condescend to remind you that the corpse privilege numbers among the hereditary seniorial rights. It is not a right, but rather a power, Dreff returned very deliberately, and the tyrant choosing to exercise that power is altogether vile. Elise's breath caught, and her eyes widened in pure disbelief. He had gone mad. No other explanation was possible. Grief or sunstroke had curdled that fine mind, and now he was totally mad. More than one of the listening serfs had gasped audibly. "'What did you say?' the Marquise inquired incredulously. "'I said that the corpse privilege is an abomination, one of the very worst of the myriad outrages, outrages inflicted upon the populace by a privileged and useless minority. Did you hear me that time? I wish to be certain that you do.' No answer from the astonished Marquise. Eyes fixed on Dreff's face, Elise shook her head urgently. Ignoring the signal, Dreff resumed. The inequities of our laws are immoral, and the resulting ruthlessness of the exalted is demonic. Nothing could illustrate the truth of this more vividly than the events of this day, which commence with a destruction discovery of a young serf's transgression. The nature of the crime? Zen Subison was caught reading the forbidden essay, essays of Shorvi Narayan. And why, at the outset, has the seigneur found it necessary to prescribe Narayan's works? Clearly because his lordship fears the ideas contained therein, perceives the concepts as perhaps threatening to his lordship's parasitical way of life. Finding it easier to suppress such ideas than to confront them, the seigneur issued th his prohibition, which then Subison, cursed with an active and inquisitive mind, disregarded. Disobedience discovered, the boy is locked up in the stable for hours without water on one of the hottest days of the year, treatment that would not be meted out to the worst of the horses for which that stable was constructed. At the end of the day, he is removed from the stable, tied to a post, and publicly whipped to death, at which time the seigneur, no doubt resolved to mitigate his loss of property, consigns the corpse to the dissection table. And there, within one day, is epitomized the relation of exalted to serf, oppressor to victim, predator to prey. In his acts of cowardice, tyranny, cruelty, and homicide, the Marquis Fauderval proves himself a fit representative of his class, one whose deeds inspire a disgust ultimately reducing to simple contempt. Dreff had not once raised his voice. His restraint added immeasurably to the force of his de denunciation. Awful silence. The spectators seemed paralyzed. Face purpling, the Marquise Fauderaval struggled for reply, but his fury was too great to express itself in words. And in any case, he has no verbal match for the serf. Temporarily deprived of speech, he sought outlet in action. 
abandoning the chaise, the seigneur advanced a few unsteady paces, halted several feet from his motionless accuser, and plied his whip. The strokes descended upon Dreff's shoulders, sides, and upraised arm. The young man's reaction was purely instinctive. Ducking beneath the flying lash, he sprang forward, wrested the whip from the Marquise's grasp, and flung the weapon aside. The Marquise slapped the serf's face hard, and the blow cracked like a pistol shot. Without, sh without thought or hesitation, almost reflexively, Dreff doubled his fist and struck back to send his master sprawling. For a moment the Marquise lay where he had fallen, then sat up slowly, one hand pressed to his face. His nose was bleeding. A thin red stream trickled down his face to drip off the side of his chin. The sight might easily have provoked him, have provoked laughter. Just now, no one exhibited the slightest amusement. The watching serfs were elated, but badly frightened, and at least certain of her father's reaction was terrified. Dreff himself seemed somewhat at a loss. As he stood absently rubbing his knuckles, his expression reflected bemusement. The Marquise rose. His face was blank. A display of emotion could only have demeaned him further. Turning to Borlo Bunison, he commanded simply, Attack! Borlo was glum but disobedient. Striding forward, he made a grab for the younger and lighter man, who easily eluded him. Borlo threw a punch, which Dreff dodged. A second swing was equally ineffectual. This time, Dreff sprang in, drove his fist into the blacksmith's midsection, and slid out of reach again. Despite the speed and force of the blow, Borlo appeared to feel nothing. His adversary might just as well have struck a brick wall, an increasingly angry brick wall. Borlo's heavy brows were lowering, and a scowl creased his forehead as he lumbered in pursuit of his annoyingly nimble opponent. The next time he struck, it was with sufficient force to stun a bull, and the blow landed. Once again, Dreff dodged, hit, and danced away. A slight grunt escaped Borlo Bunison at the other's fist thudded home. Beyond that, he appeared impervious. Catching his steward's eye, the Marquise held up two fingers, whereupon the steward issued command to two of the largest and sturdiest young plowmen in his immediate vicinity. <clears throat> vicinity. The plowman jumped into the fight. Aware too late, Dreff spun to meet them, and a whizzing fist took him full in the face, striking him to the ground. Before he had stirred to raise himself, both plowmen flung themselves upon him, their combined weight pinning him down. Borlo Bunison approached without haste, gazed impassively down into his adversary's eyes, then drew back his foot and kicked hard. Dreff's face contorted as the toe of Borlo's hobnailed boot slammed into his ribs. Several more kicks followed in quick succession. Eventually, this diversion palled and Borlo ceased, whereupon the plowman hauled Dreff to his feet and held him upright. Borlo considered briefly, then threw a series of sharp, jabbing punches into the prisoner's face and body, concluding with a straight right to the point of the chin. Dreff's head snapped backward. An instant later, he sagged unconscious between his two captors. They released him, and he slumped to the ground. Nausea threatened to overwhelm Elise. Never in her life had she witnessed such brutality, and scarcely would she have credited its, its existence upon the Daraval estate. That the victim of violence should be Dreff 
Her draft rendered the scene doubly nightmarish. Now she sat struggling for breath as her eyes traveled from the corpse of Zen Subasan to Dref Zenosin's motionless form and back again. Poor Zen was far beyond help, but Dref still, still lived, now the object of his master's particular hatred and in danger of the direct punishment if she knew her math if she knew her father. Elise glanced sidelong at the Marquise. He stood a few paces distant, red splotched handkerchief still pressed to his face, although the bleeding had ceased. His eyes were fixed upon the combatants, his face quite expressionless. Now was the time to address him, before worse punishment for dress dref was de was decreed. When she spoke, her air of unconcern was tolerably convincing. Why, the wretch is either delirious or else quite mad. Surely he hadn't the least idea what he said or did, and must not be held accountable. Mad. <clears throat> mad, the Marquise repeated meditatively. What structural anomalies might not distinguish the brain of a lunatic? Surely the matter is worthy of investigation. Elise froze momentarily, all too aware of her error, then replied with indifference. Perhaps he is only drunk. Perhaps that is the explanation. In any event, it seems very tedious to me, very absurd, all this furor over a single unruly surf. I should think it is beneath your notice, father. Or is it perhaps the current fashion in Shireen, this preoccupation with menials? The Marquise turned to glance at her reply, encountered a faint but perceptibly patronizing smile. He frowned. As she had intended, her reference to the capital city stirred unpleasant recollections of his recent sojourn therein, during which he had so often been made to feel the clumsy provincial. He had a morbid fear of his peer's ridicule, although he would never have admitted it. Perhaps he was lowering himself. Perhaps his concern was excessive. But it was not too late to re re rescue his threatened dignity. Scarcely a preoccupation, his lordship replied coldly. And yet I can hardly overlook his offense. Signorial duty includes the magisterial function. Well, Elise carefully adjusted the brim of her hat. The fellow has been punished. In the meantime, the heat is oppressive, the spectacle unappetizing, and I am perishing of discomfort. I wish to return to my chamber at once. Punished? No, he informed his daughter. A minor drubbing does not begin to expiate so great a crime. More is required. But not this instant. The hour is late, we are all fatigued, and the culprit is insensible. I shall order him confined under Bunison's guard until morning. When he is awake and fit to profit by the lesson, he shall receive punishment commensurate with his offense. Elise watched in well-concealed dread as the Marquise crooked a summoning finger. The steward immediately advanced to receive his master's low-voiced commands, which were in turn relayed to Borla Bunnison and a clutch of his cohorts. Two of the plowmen lifted Dref from the ground and carried him off to the stable, while the corpse of Zen Subasun was borne to the ice house. The seigneur returned to the chaise, mounted, and took up the reins. He had wiped all the blood from his face. His movements were calm and deliberate, but his nose was inflamed and swollen, his face mottled red and white, and the blazing bloodshot eyes belied the artificial composure. Commensurate with his offense, Elise prompted. Exactly so, the Marquise purposefully raised his voice to a volume audible to the assembled serfs. The tongue that reviled the seigneur shall be cut out. The hand raised against the seigneur shall be cut off. Nothing more is required, and nothing less. This is 
perfect and unquestionable justice. Elise stared at him speechlessly. The serfs were similarly mute. Fortunately, the Marquise Faudaravel neither expected nor desired reply. Shaking the reins, he clucked at the horses, and the chaise rattled off toward the great house. As they went, Elise could not forbear casting one look back over her shoulder, and immediately she regretted it for the last image she carried from that place was the face of Steli Zina's girl, with its look of frozen horror and hatred. Thank you for listening to Orion's Bedtime Stories podcast. We hope you've enjoyed it. And that you have a lovely, relaxing evening. Thank you, and sweet dreams.